it's like there's a big problem that a lot of people have we found the problem to it and now you know the momentum is there so I really just want to continue to work in businesses that feel more like that that's one of my driving forces without a doubt and so any innovation that we come out with needs to kind of be true to our core three principles which are performance design and sustainability it has to be as good at performing its function as any of the competitors or better you know it has to have human centric design you know, the way it feels the way it looks the way it performs you know like how long it lasts etc and then lastly it needs to be significantly more sustainable than other options out there aloha and welcome to another episode of the ground source this podcast where i connect you to outstanding humans and sustainable ideas. I'm your host, Scott Martin. Today, we have the one and only Mark Rushmore. He's the founder of Surrey Toothbrushes, or a co-founder of it. He's somebody that's gone way back with me, um, with Tony Robbins. Uh, we met uh, in 2018-19 and traveled the, the world together when we're on sort of a bit of a world tour and uh, really connected with him being his background in uh, marketing and advertising. And he's gone off to build just um, a really surprising and and exciting story in the sustainable space and products. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his story and his journey. So without further ado, let's paddle in. All right, here we are with another episode with the one and only Mark Rushmore. Welcome. Thank you very much, Scott. Pleasure to be here. So for those of you who don't know this man's name, you soon will. Um, he has, he's someone that goes way back. We met, I don't know, probably about five years ago. We spent a year traveling the globe together with Tony Robbins and uh, uh, just we're always connected really well because we had such a, a common background in the marketing industry to some degree. And then he left and then he went up in the abyss and he went and did a whole bunch of amazing things. And, and what he built was something that I really wanted to bring forward is this business that I've been tracking um, and I want you to, if you don't mind, share a little bit of the background what led up to it, and then tell us a little bit about the company. Sure. So um, my co-founder and I set up this company called Surrey, which is short for Sustainable Rituals, and we make the world's most desirable and sustainable electric toothbrush. So uh, I imagine you brush your teeth, Scott? I do, every day. Well, every day, right? <laughs> I try to. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and so did lots of other people. In fact, over 50% of people in North America and in the UK and Germany and other developed markets uh, use an electric brush because they're significantly better for you than using a manual brush. But what we discovered in our research was that every year over 4 billion toothbrushes, including electric ones, are thrown away and end up in landfill in our oceans, uh, particularly pertinent if you're a surfer. And not only that, but Although electric waste accounts for about 2% of landfill, it accounts for about 70% of the toxicity found in that landfill. So we knew that there's a significant problem there when it comes to toothbrushes. But what's more is that electric toothbrushes haven't meaningfully changed in decades. They are bulky, as they were sort of 30 years ago. 99.9% of them are welded shut. So when the battery dies, you have to throw them away, which is both not economical or sustainable. And then lastly, often the battery life is really poor due to features that People just tell us they don't use. Do you use a Bluetooth app every day when you brush your teeth, Scott? Nope. No, you and no one else. But what you find is that you're having to charge your battery probably every few days or every week or so because of things that you're not using like Bluetooth, flashing lights, nine modes. So we redesigned a toothbrush from bottom up. So our brush is made from more sustainable materials. We offer free recycling with the heads. We have a tiny screw in the bottom of our brush so that when the battery dies, we can replace the battery. So this could be the last toothbrush you ever buy. Um, What's more, it's about half the size of a traditional brush. We don't include Bluetooth. Instead, our battery lasts 40 days on a single charge, and we include a travel case which has a UV LED light, which kills 99.9% of bacteria on the bristles. So it's a brush that performs really well. It's clinically proven to give you as good a clean as the competitors from the world's leading research center. Um, It's more sustainable, and also it's more desirable in terms of like how it looks and how it feels. Wow, that was a great little rundown of the company and and what the the product does. So why did why like what made you decide to do a toothbrush? I mean, when you and I talked, I never even heard the word toothbrush. What happened? Like, how what was the? Give us a little journey into your background. Like, let's start with a little bit of your background. Your background has been in marketing, advertising. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure. So um, the full story is after university, I joined this company called Procter & Gamble, which I think particularly in North America, more people are familiar with, but you know, it's the largest consumer product goods brand in the world. And I worked in a variety of sales and strategy and marketing roles, ultimately managing the Pringles brand, which was doing um, over 
200 million pounds in sales in the UK when it was bought by Kellogg's. So I helped transition the business from P&G to Kellogg's successfully. Um, but as part of that arrangement of moving that business across, as a guy in my mid twenties, I was given this amazing opportunity where I, I basically earned three years salary for six months work. And so I started thinking like, what am I going to do with that, with that money essentially? And at a similar time, um, uh, an acquaintance of mine from university, unfortunately committed suicide. And it just got me really thinking like, you know, do I want to wait until I retire to live out all my dreams or with this money, should I try and do something different? So I wrote down a list of things I wanted to achieve. I wanted to do an adventure that would last a lifetime. I wanted to learn skills that I could teach my children. I wanted to do something that would normally take more than my entire annual holiday. So I became a ski instructor in Fernie, Canada, so I could teach my children. I then cycled unsupported from uh, Canada to Mexico. And then I took part in a social media competition to sail around the world and I, I won that competition so I was meant to sail from China to um, San Francisco and then ultimately I want to set up my own company and so I set up uh, an experiential marketing agency that agency uh, was actually I set up UK office of a German agency and I quickly scaled it to over a million pounds in revenue in the first six months which sounds really exciting but actually really drove me to the point of burnout and my, my girlfriend now wife almost left me because I ended up with like 14 people around my kitchen table but I helped grow that business over five years ultimately exiting it just before I joined Tony Robbins and during that time I worked with one oral B as a client across Europe so I learned a lot about what they did in the dental profession so although that was a wild ride honestly like there were some real highs in that business and some really really big lows and so when I came to Tony Robbins I was really looking to think about like what do I want next in my life? Like, how do I want to be not just in terms of business success, but as a person? And so, you know, one of the exercises, as I'm sure you'll know, is to write down a list of things that you would like for your future. So I wrote down a whole list of things. You know, I'd love to have a family with my wife. I would love to set up another company. I would love that company to have a huge potential market. So, you know, something like toothbrushes where everyone brushes their teeth um, I want the business to be able to at least get to 100 million pounds in revenue but I most importantly I want to do something that has an impact something that I can be proud of you know that I can tell my children I you know address like a significant problem and that the growth of that company is tied in some way to some good so that the more you grow the company the more good you do so I spent then another 18 months trying to work out what that company was. I ended up actually setting up a, a tequila brand with another plat, um, which was great, but it didn't meet some of the criteria with that I'd spent, you know, a year sort of planning and visualizing and working towards. And so when I came across the opportunity to create Surrey with one of my former colleagues at Procter & Gamble, I looked at the market and thought, okay, this is a huge market. Everyone brushes their teeth. Everyone's familiar with it. There's two companies with over an 80% market share, which is very unusual. People are very apathetic towards those brands. You know, they become highly commoditized. People don't really love them. They haven't focused on consumer experience or indeed, like, I don't think they've built up a groundswell of support. Um, and so it just seemed like an obvious thing to do, especially when we could make it more sustainable and add a charitable element um, that, yeah, that that's, that's how it kind of came to fruition. But I, there were some dark moments in between those 18 months where I thought, what am I going to do? Mm. And what's the charitable component? I didn't know that. So we measure every you know part of our emission process, and so it's, it's whether you call it charitable or not. But like we measure everything, then we take steps to reduce it in the supply chain, whether that's moving to like more efficient, greener modes of transport or different materials or different energy production, and then we invest in offsets, which is by no means like a perfect solution from a sustainability perspective, but it does mean that you know, a portion of our profits go towards clean water wells in Sierra Leone, removing plastic from the ocean uh, with different partners. And so the more that we sort of grow, the more that we can contribute towards some of those projects. Exciting. And I uh, <clears throat> was really excited to see that you're a B uh, corporation. Yeah. Tell me about That's the B. journey of that. That's, I think that a lot of people see that and they don't understand it. Um, what is the impact um, you know, just tell me a little bit about that for somebody who doesn't even know what that is and why did you decide to do it? So that was also my dream list of things that I wrote when I was in my Tony Robbins year. And for those who don't know about it, basically, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, capitalism can have like both like good and bad sides of it. Um, and I think there's, you know, definitely been a wave of people who think, you know, anything capitalism is, is bad. 
Um, but it doesn't have to be like that. And the B Corporation is really saying that like business can be a force for good, both for profit, because ultimately it's only sustainable if you're profitable, um, but also for people and for planet. So making sure you have great policies for other people, as well as, um, you know, from an environmental perspective. And the journey on it has so... been great. I mean, it's a lot of work. What's, the, re what's the requirements to be that, though? What's the, so, like, what's the um, there's a lot of different requirements. You go through a stringent <clears throat> testing process and you have to provide documentation to show your policies towards people, towards um, your environmental impact. And there's a lot of in-depth uh, third-party verified studies. You know, I was just asking, like, it's a pretty significant investment of, of time or money or both or what? It's definitely a significant um, investment in time um, to a certain extent money because you, you know, you need to employ people to do this, but also, you know, some of the reports that you need. So we needed to have measured all of our emission, which was a time consuming process. And we worked with a third party in order to do that. Um, but fortunately, we found, you know, an enthusiastic Cambridge educated graduate who was looking to make an impact and he helped lead that project for us. Beautiful. So what, what's next for Mark Rushmore? Like, what are you, what's, so your business is now off the ground. I've got this beautiful, you know, brand. I'm seeing you getting awards. I'm seeing you got um, some exciting news. I keep seeing on your LinkedIn. That's what kind of prompted me to, to pick up the phone and call you. But like, what do you see as really next? Like within this brand and yourself and, and just frankly, like, you know, just in your journey of, of what you're doing, how do you see what you've been doing shaping or reshaping the, the category that you're in? It's a great question. So we've had this phenomenal run. We started shipping in May last year, and now we're doing well over a million dollars a month in revenue um, across our direct consumer, Amazon and retail businesses. And we expect that to double or triple in, in the coming 12 months. So, you know, really kind of like growing a team, maintaining the culture, ensuring that we have enough money for stock, uh, some of the key challenges that we have. I think in terms of the category, you know, definitely people seeing that there's, you know, consumers want a product which has a great unboxing experience, which is more sustainable, which focuses on consumer led insights. So like having a long battery is more important than having a Bluetooth app. And I think the consumers who who write reviews for us and we're the most highly rated electric toothbrush on Trustpilot. I think those reviews come from the fact that we've put in a lot of care and attention into the whole experience and to, you know, service the customer afterwards as well. And I think that's the way it should be. And it's, it's what consumers expect nowadays. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of category, what we're seeing is, you know, we're, we're quickly growing our category share on, on different platforms like Amazon. And uh, we just, uh, were listed in the largest retailer of electric brushes in the UK called Boots. So um, I'm not sure when this podcast will be coming out, but there's an exciting Hollywood actress who has a store, uh, will be featured in their gift guide this Christmas. And there's a lot of North American retailers who are very interested in stocking us. And so, you know, the next few years hopefully look like we can hopefully grow to become a, you know, globally recognized brand that people love because of our design, sustainability, and performance. Beautiful. You know, it's like, so you've got a background, you've been working in, you'd had an agency before, just like I did, both had the similar experience of burnout from it. Now, a lot of people that I'm, I, I interview and I talk with, they're usually like, you know, authors and they have service businesses, but um, you're probably the first one that has a product business. Well, tell me what's been the biggest surprise or challenge or, insights you can share about crossing the chasm from a being sort of a service business and going into what I see as a heavy capital, like high, high capitalization requirements to get started in a product business. What are some of the insights and things you've learned from this process that you would have like, maybe question. didn't know before? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I think, you know, this, this is almost quite a unique journey. So I'm not sure if this is true of all B2C experiences, but I felt like, as an agency owner and runner, you know, it's like for me, you're constantly trying to win new business um, and the sales process of winning, you know, big B2B clients can be much longer. And to a certain extent, the growth was linear. We would win, you know, uh, BMW as a client and then we'd have to hire a proportionate number of people. And so it was fairly linear in terms of growth and, and sort of margins. 
Whereas with a product business, we've scaled it to, you know, we're, we're, like every month is growing so much more quickly and we're really seeing this sort of uh, exponential type curve to our growth because to a certain extent, you, you can have that with a product in a way that you can't necessarily with an agency or, or certainly the type of agency I ran. And so, you know, we're only a team of 12 people and we're aiming to do more than $1 million per head in revenue um, and actually exceed that sort of. And so that sort of gives you some idea as to um, maybe the difference. Other, I guess it depends what kind of agency you ran. So um, that's one thing that's true. But the other difference is before, you know, I had 10 core clients and now we have over 100,000 customers. And so actually how you nurture that community, how you communicate with them, how you really kind of um, show them that attention, which is what we try to do in our agency is, is kind of a core component of what we're looking to do because ultimately, you know, it's our, our customers who support the mission, the product, the journey, who will be our sort of longest term advocates. So this is a direct to consumer product? Predominantly. Okay. So that with direct to consumer product that you have these um, customer relationships, are you, um, are you able to grow through, um, you know, building, are you building a community, like you mentioned community, but do you actually have like a community or how does that show up? Like how's, how are you interacting with the customers other than just point of sale, email response, um, get back to us if you want to buy another product? Like what are you, are you doing something different? That's a great question, Scott. And one of the many reasons I need to keep talking to you and I consume your content because, you know, I think we could be doing a much better job than, than what we are doing currently. Um, but, you know, there's different elements to like how we to work with the community. So one is on, on just responding on customer service. If someone has an issue or has a question, mm -hmm. like, you know, we've really heavily over invested there versus our competitors and you'll get a response from us really quickly. And often people give us, you know, our five star ratings because of that level of service. You know, I took a lot of inspiration from the way Zappos tried to, you know, ensure that any customer who communicates with them has a great experience. We're not perfect, far from it, but we certainly try our hardest on that. So that's one element of community building. We then have um, more useful content. So people who are in our email flow, yes, we do you know, provide offers, but we also provide insights on things like sustainable living, on you know, optimal uh, dental techniques from dental professionals. And so we're trying to provide like a little bit more information there. Um, and then also, you know, through um, things like our partnerships. So we've just done a partnership with Wired Magazine, which I think is big in the US as well. This oh, year. yeah, huge. Yep. And, um, and what's great is we um, have done a sort of long term partnership with them where they run events with, you know, great, great speakers on really interesting topics, whether it's impact or energy and all their speakers are given a Surrey toothbrush and we get to sort of engage at those events. But off the back of that, for example, we just had this man called Andy Baines, who you may or may not know, it, um, used to be, used to report directly into Steve Jobs and then into Tim Cook. And he helped on the hardware side from an environmental perspective on all the development of Apple. He then left Apple to create this company called Nest, um, which he sold oh, yeah. to Google for $3 billion. And so he was in our office last week and, you know, he's a huge hardware fan and, you know, obviously an environmental, you know, fan as well. And so it's great to be able to, you know, have those partnerships, but also then we, with our community, we're able to invite people to those events and kind of get them involved um, at like a top level. Yeah, that's cool. And it's like this, I can see how this, you could, you could even expand your product offering and you could be tucked into so many different sustainable um, communities of people. There's a big shift. Like, I think the timing of what you've done is really brilliant because, you know, there's always been a need for purpose. You look at Patagonia, different brands have been around, but they were kind of on the leading edge. And I, it's just, I've seen the shift over the last five years of, in an exponential way of purpose-driven businesses, people wanting to spend money They'll pay more money. In fact, they'll 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 uh, wait longer uh, and do go over you know obstacles to support their purpose. And um, you know, I'm curious what what sort of like responses you've had. Is there any sort of like customer response you're like, wow, I didn't even know that that had an impact on them or something like that? Or what has been sort of your? It maybe it's even industry wide. Like what's sort of been the the response to this? toothbrush being, you know, sustainable. I would have never thought of that. That's what's so, it's just such a 
fucking it, so, it just throw me off. Like it's just so funny. Like it's it's awesome, but it's like a hanger. It's like, of course, it's like everybody uses it every day. So here's the thing, like we believe like sustainability shouldn't come with any compromise. It shouldn't cost any more. It shouldn't mean that like there's less like good design or less great features. And so while like we've made our product, you know, way more sustainable than any competitor uh, that we're aware of um, in the category, that doesn't come with the compromise of anything else. And I think for us, that's really the core. You know, Tesla doesn't necessarily talk about how it's so much greener than other cars. Um, but what they do talk about is, you know, how fast the car goes, you know, the cool sort of um, engagement with like the extra large screen in the middle and the software updates and and really just focus on like the things that really people care about, you know, like what does it look like? How does it feel? And so we took a lot of inspiration from that in terms of, you know, we want to surprise and delight people with every element. So from the unboxing to the fast delivery to um, the feel of the product, you know, it's made from aluminium. It's really smooth. It, it just looks so much more design led, like other parts of your life, like your phone, like your car, like your, um, you know, cosmetics, etc. And so I think what you see in our reviews and if you ask me what I was most proud about, uh, aside from like the impact we're making, it's definitely our customer reviews. We have over 3,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot. And, and it's in those responses, you see people go, you know, I hate my X toothbrush. It always breaks. It's always got that gunk on the bottom. The battery always dies. Um, and I, I feel so bad about throwing it away. I've got 10 of them left in my drawer that I just can't pull myself to throw away um, because I know it's going to end up in landfill. And I think, you know, people then write, you know, I don't, you know, I've always thought brushing my teeth was a chore. I now love it. I'm looking forward to brushing my teeth. Never thought I'd say that. And I think it's actually that difference in expectations. People have such low expectations in this category because it's like a chore that you have to do. And by flipping that sort of like low expectation with like, you know, a delightful experience, that that contrast between, you know, um, something that was a chore into a joy that crossing that is is what is like the magic of, of our brand. Well, that's cool innovation. You know, it's like you understated and I would have led with that, frankly, because your your branding and, and marketing, I mean, most people that are sustainable businesses, they they hang on to like, oh yeah, we're sustainable. And so you're gonna where you're kind of you're kind of going, that's the that's the it's the, the surprise of it. But the reality is you were fat you know, forward with the fashion, the design, the innovation of it, which I think is totally forward thinking. I mean, it's like at the end of the day, you're right. I mean, if you, if people want to do both, people will step over things that are have less quality, but if you can do both, I mean, now it's like setting a new bar. It's like a new standard. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing in a lot of uh, products that are coming forward is there's this, this new thinking. And, you know, do you see yourself as innovating with some other products as well? Like, are you continue on this journey? Oh, definitely. We have some, quite frankly, in my opinion, like our next product innovation, if it, if it works, like I think it can, I think it could be multiples bigger than this. Um, it's, it's a, um, a format change, uh, in a huge industry, which redefines like how people will think of this product. I can't reveal this unfortunately right now, but I'd love to come That's back fine. on and talk another time when, um, when I can, but you know, you talked about setting a new standard. That's exactly what you want to do. Create raving fans. That's exactly what you want to do. And as you know, like those are some of the things that we learned um, on that Tony Robbins year. You know, it's kind of like some of the kind of business fundamentals, I guess. Yeah, the the um, and you know, I'm still I'm still so involved with uh, Tony Robbins. How has that affected you? Like, if you if you look back at at that year of of how has that uh, affected your thinking, your mindset, uh, you know, your commitment to this direction? So there's two answers to that. When I was like in my year, you know, I was definitely full on 100% sold in, bought in, you know, I'm like, the, you know, telling everyone about it and, mm -hmm. you know, very much like in the hype. I think then I kind of came out and I felt a little bit like, oh, wait a second, maybe I can't maintain this. And, and was it really worth it kind of question mark? But then actually what I've really seen is that like a lot of it, maybe sunk in and and like it was kind of held like sort of deep within me some of the core lessons and you know whether it's setting new standard creating raving fans you know like getting in to a certain state to deal with certain issues and knowing when to flex between different states um has really been crucial to absolutely everything i do you know and having that 
you know, a routine where you're sort of thinking about your results and how you want to achieve them through to having an amazing community of people like yourself, Scott, who continue to inspire me and, you know, raise my standards to kind of live a better life. I think it's, it's been absolutely fundamental. Cool. And I, I'm the same way. I'm just like, I, and I, I, you know, I'm, I love it so much, but it's like, it's, it's in me. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's almost become second nature in a lot of ways. And, and just for, but you also having removed yourself and kind of like now immersing into this, do you, do you have, like, do you find that you've now adapted, you've created your own sort of a methodology for innovation? Like, for example, you've got this new, new product that, that you're coming out with, was it led by a market need? Was it led because of an open market? Like what was the, because sometimes we're meeting demand or we're creating demand. And, you know, if you look at those two things, what were you doing? And without revealing the product and just sort of like break us down to your, what's your process sure. for making a decision? Because that's a fundamental major commitment of time and, and capital to move in a direction. You got to have a level of certainty. So what what's what's kind of how, like walk us through if I'm inside your brain, how did you get there? So there's two things to it. And it kind of what the first part of the answer refers back to what you asked me before, the difference between an agency and, and like this kind of product. Before I felt like I was pushing a rock up a hill constantly, constantly trying to like persuade people why they needed to use my agency, constantly, you know, like trying to get work and, and share of that work and maintain it. Whereas this feels like pushing a rock or a boulder down a hill. You know, it's like there's a big problem that a lot of people have. We found the problem to it and now you know, the momentum is there. So I really just want to continue to work in businesses that feel more like that. That's one of my driving forces without a doubt. And so any innovation that we come out with needs to kind of be true to our core three principles, which are performance, design, and sustainability. It has to be as good at performing its function as any of the competitors or better. You know, it has to have human centric design, you know, the way it feels, the way it looks, the way it performs, you know, like how long it lasts, etc. And then lastly, it needs to be significantly more sustainable than other options out there. So what we then do is like look at the categories. Okay, you know, is there a category here which is large, which everyone, you know, uses? Um, is there a way, you know, is it sustainable or are there sustainable options? Do those sustainable options compromise, yes or no? If they do, then okay, wow, there's a big opportunity to innovate on innovation on sustainability then we look at design is there any issues with the design in the products that exist on the market you know could they look nicer could they you know be better for traveling could they be more compact um etc and then lastly you know how do we make it perform as well do you know what i mean like it can't come at a compromise you don't want to use a product which um has a compromise on that front and so by finding a large market with problems that we can solve through our core three, you know, areas. That's how we find out what we're going to innovate with. And hopefully if we get that right, then we can push a rock down a hill. Beauty. So step one, you found, you found you've, that's how you process for finding the innovation. Now the next two steps are probably things that people really get lost on, which is a, how did you fund this stuff? Like, did you get partners? Did you pull it out of your own pocket? Were you scrappy? Did you get investors? Like whatever. And then how do you operationalize it? Because those there's so many people go, I've got these ideas, but the, there's a huge chasm between I've done that work. I've, I've got a couple ideas even myself. And I'm like, oh, man, like, what do I got to do to kind of capitalize this? What's what what what's been your process or experience? Yeah. So on, on the second part of, you know, what like how do you get from the idea into actually maybe on the first part on funding, because that's the most important one. We knew that we want to create a really fast growth company and get it to as many people as possible. There's also heavy costs involved with like tooling, manufacturing, prototyping, et cetera. So we knew this business wasn't going to be bootstrapped. Um, so we got investments. We've done two rounds of investment from a series of angel investors and venture capitalists. Um, and what we found is as we've progressed and got more and more traction, more and more venture capitalists from around the world are interested in, in the business. So actually we're about to, as of tomorrow, start raising our series A, um, which will help us to continue our growth. Um, so that's on the first part. And on the second part, how do you do it? It really is just a matter of doing it. And that's like what I've found is that 99% of people will not just take the first step, which is as simple as going on to alibaba.com and saying, you know, electric toothbrush manufacturers, and then, you know, emailing however many you want with your sort of ideas, 
you know, obviously you need to like look at materials and costs. We actually spoke to 25 factories, um, 24 of whom just laughed down the phone at us when we said we wanted to be, create something bespoke. They said, no, no, you should take, you know, one of our existing models because they're all about efficiency. They don't want to take risks. Um, mm -hmm. And so we had to persuade them, you know, the 25th one who finally said, you know, yes, it can be done with these, you know, groundbreaking materials. We use cornstarch in the hair casserole and the bristles. No one has ever done that before. Um, no one had made a modular design. And so it is very unique. It's very difficult to do what we've done, but that also helps us create a moat. So my advice to anyone would be just take the first three steps. You don't, it doesn't commit you for life. I think, again, it's a Tony Robbins thing, but a lot of people will stop doing something because of fear. So you have to kind of get yourself into like the state of certainty and say like, you know what, I'm going to, what's the smallest step I can do? And it's probably Googling it on Alibaba. Can I buy it already? Can I identify three factories that could potentially do it? Can I cold email three factories and, and kind of just go from there. And it's just really taking those like little baby steps is, you know, if you want to climb Mount Everest, the way you start is by taking your first step. And although it's a cliche, it's, it's a cliche for a reason. You don't just like hop to halfway. And what about the investment? Like, like how did you go about identifying and actually pitching and, and just like the whole process of getting your first round of angel investors? I think that's like a real, for a lot of people, it's just like, I don't, they don't even know where to begin with that. I have some experience in it, but I'm curious what your journey has been. So different people have different experiences. I, I absolutely love this. I love people, Scott. Like I really love people and I love listening to different people's ideas. So some people hate rejection. I love rejection. I love finding out, okay, why, why doesn't it work for you? What do you think? Okay. And then it helps me to like refine, you know, how we approach it. But, you know, we were pretty fortunate. My co-founder and I have a a background in the industry. We both worked at Procter & Gamble. We both worked in fast moving consumer goods, you know, in marketing, finance, sales, and strategy. So we have a good pedigree background. Beyond that, one of my clients was Oral-B and my partner ran several e-commerce companies successfully. So knows how to use Shopify and, you know, um, Meta and Google ad spend and, you know, to a certain extent, build a social um, following. And so I think a lot of investors, okay, like, okay, do we believe that these people have the right background, skills, et cetera, to do the job? And, you know, obviously you've got to play that up as much as possible, but I think that that was a cool part of it. I think then, you know, is it a big addressable market? Is it, is there a significant problem? And do these guys have a solution to that? And I think for us, you know, a lot of people brush their teeth. There's two companies with over an 80% market share you know, is there a significant problem? Do a lot of people not use Bluetooth, have poor batteries, you know, care about the sustainability? Absolutely. It kind of sounds a bit cliche, you know, find a big problem, solve it. But that's very much at the core. So I think between the, the problem solution and the team, that was enough to get us our initial investment. Um, but then from there, we said, you know, we will grow to this many sales within our first year. You know, we probably four or five x that. And so when we came to our next round of investment, you know, we said, look, this is what we said we'd do in a year. And we surpassed all those targets very clearly. And we'd laid them out the year before. And I think that's something actually that we really, has really helped us is that a lot of investors, like the majority rejected us in our first funding round, but we had really great relationships. They wished us luck. And then we kept in touch with them over the next 12 months so that they saw like, oh, wow, those guys said they were going to do it. And they really did do it. So when it came to the second round of funding, we had, I think, five offers from VCs, we only had space to take one. Um, and so it's, you know, it's kind of continued on that track. And that's kind of what we always want to do is, you know, lay out what our vision is over exceed expectations against those targets. Um, and yeah, hopefully build a, a, a brand that people love. Dude, that was highly valuable. I mean, if I think about what you just said there, most people that whether it's sales or business and especially investors, if they get rejected, um, you know, it sounds like you're asking why. So you're getting, you're getting the gold from them, right? That's what you're saying. And then sure. two, the, the genius here is that you followed up with them. Most people would never do that. That actually is like, like you're, that's so forward thinking. So was that a strategy you guys deployed? Were you doing it just because like, what was the thinking? Like, was that actually a plan or was that just sort of a, just the way you are? I mean, 
honestly, I just love people, and I, I love you know clever people with interesting perspectives. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, look, I'm not going to say I kept in touch with absolutely everyone. There are some people who I thought actually you're not the kind of person who I want to go into business with, because it is a two-way thing. You know, it's not just like oh, I, I'll take any money, um, and so. But yeah, but certainly like along the journey, I've had so many people who've offered, you know, really useful insights or a different perspective or, or got me to think about things in you know, a different way. And even if I disagreed, like I really value that. And, and, I, and I love people, you know, like ultimately, you know, a lot of these people are really interesting, see lots of companies, have really great insights. Um, and so, you know, I like to think that, you know, business is one part of my life. Um, but, you know, how, how you make people feel is what they remember and, and likewise, you know, just you never know who you're going to bump into in the future. So I like to try and maintain relationships where possible. Totally. I mean, it's like I, I feel like that's how you and I have stayed in touch. Whenever someone makes an impression, they're really intelligent, clever, and, and I feel like I can hang out with them. Um, I, I don't even know where it's going to go. I, I just go, ah, I'm just going to stay in touch. That's, you yeah. know, that's like I've been, you know, and that's to me is like, with no no judgment or or like you know like there's some benefit or something um and it always works out you know it's like i look at the series that i'm doing former plat uh she's miss uh hawaii national geographic explorer i've been staying in touch with her since doing clubhouses and now we're doing a project together we're launching something that's like going to be fantastic and and i'm like she's world renowned and i'm like it's only because we just maintained contact like susan casey who just wrote a i just did a podcast with her i, I literally just launch that that I mean I would have had to be tenacious to get her to write a blurb to get to read my book to get her on my pod that took years but it was like she was worth it because she's so cool like when you, I don't know if you got to listen to that episode but like oh my gosh like her storytelling yeah. is just incredible you know and you know I think that that's one thing I like about you is you're just such a likable guy <laughs> it doesn't surprise me to see the success you know I, I can totally see you know unbelievable future for you um, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you know, you've been kind enough to read my book is what do you see? Like when you've read my book Groundswell and you look at the stuff that you're doing, where do you see the intersection of that book? Because I, I really wrote it for impact creators. Um, and, but I didn't really, I mean, to me, it was like the vision of the like, people making an impact, making a difference in the world and creating, you know, momentum and growth and, and with an audience. But um, I can see like, you know, even your direct to consumer, there's another sort of like thought I never really you know thought about, which was the groundswell, maybe not necessarily building an audience, but building a building a, a, a I guess you could say product sales, if you will. Like I, I just didn't really kind of address it that clearly, but I'm just curious what you got from it and what's sort of your vision of of this intersection, if at all. A hundred percent. So I mean, firstly, thank you so much for your kind words. You know, I couldn't speak more highly of you. You're just one of those people who, from the first time we met, you know, it's just, you just know you just want to keep in touch. And like, you know, whether we stay in like close contact or speak every now and then, I just kind of feel super grateful genuinely to, you know, have you in my life and to be able to like engage oh, with you in different formats. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Then in terms of, you know, I, I think this whole ethos around groundswell and like, like, you know what I mean? Rather than like just really heavily trading people, um, but instead like creating value for, you know, for people so that it's sustainable. It's, it just, it just feels true. You know, it just feels like authentic and real. And like, if, if you can build that successfully, then, you know, you're like, it's, it's obvious. It's like, it's like the right path. Um, I think with us, honestly, like, I think we're a bit of a hybrid because we, we, you know, we had, we spend heavily on um on ads right so you know like in terms of you know the performance marketing and I, I know you talk a little bit about how you know hey that can be quite short term um for us it's like how do you get that balance between fast growth performance marketing as well as building a grand spot as well as building like loyal brand fans and like is there a is there a combination of of the two that you can do and for me, that that's kind of the route that we're employing. So we try and employ like a little bit of both tactics. Yes, we do a lot of performance marketing, but we also want to build that like that brand loyalty and like, you know, over 15 percent of our sales are from referral. Um, and then additionally, like our existing customers are repeat purchasing for, you know, for their family, for their children, for their parents, for their siblings, for their best friends, because they love that product so much that, you know, 
they want to do it. And because they've been looked after so well by customer service, they know like, okay, if I give this product to someone, I know they're going to have a great experience. They, it's going to bring joy to their life. In fact, um, I, I, I don't know if this directly relates, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but like one, one thing, again, it's a little bit from Tony Robbins, but also from this idea of like building an audience. I try and, you know, one of the pleasures of my job is to be able to like gift people um, occasionally a brush just because. And so um, an example was I saw this guy who was laid off from Twitter, who, um, or I guess now X, but he was the head of their social media strategy, I think, either globally or, or he's really senior. And he wrote this uh, post that went viral on LinkedIn saying, you know, it was his dream job and he dedicated so much of his life and didn't know what he was going to do. And he was quite scared. He was about to have a child. And so, you know, he got thousands of comments and I just DM'd him really naively just to say hey look you know i was made redundant from kellogg's after the pringles transition and at the time it felt really scary and you know there was a lot of different emotions but ultimately it led me on this beautiful path which has you know led to many adventures and setting up businesses and and ultimately it's been the thing and you know i hope it was the same for him and you know by the way i set up this small company we'd love to pay you to be a consultant we can't afford your sort of salary um and if nothing else, I'd like to just give you a free toothbrush and, you know, in, you know, I, I think it might give you a little bit of joy. Anyway, he's, you know, he sort of politely refused. And I said, no, no, please, you know, like I, it's the joy I, I get to give it to you. He accepted it. And I didn't hear from him for like a year. And then I think last week or the week before, he just wrote the most generous, beautiful post on LinkedIn saying, you know, in the depths of my job loss and slight anxiety about the future, the last thing I wanted was a free toothbrush. I didn't know why this guy gave it to me, so I didn't open it for months. But then, you know, I did open it, and I love it. And, it, you know, for me, it's like the Apple toothbrushes. But he said every day it gives him the reminder twice a day when he wakes up and when he goes to sleep about the kindness of strangers and that there are people out there who will just do something with, for you for no other good reason than they just want to help you. And that, for me, like, you know, he posts that. He, he tells all his family about it, and, and we have these people who who – buy into what we're doing how we're doing it why we're doing it and hopefully if we can do that with a bit of performance marketing then tell me if if this captures but for me that captures some of the essence of what i took from your book yeah you know it's it's funny i what i didn't put in the book is the hybrid and, and my answer for that is you know because of course you know everybody knows me as being somewhat anti-advertising it's not that i'm anti-advertising it's like you need to do it on the fundamentals uh first and and do it and and i you know i probably I'm, I'm going to write like a, an article, but it's like, it'd be some headline like this is every sailboat has a motorboat on it. <laughs> you know, you, that's you know, it. it's, and it's, and that's it. It's like, it's, it's, the, it's but the only reason I'm so hard, hard hitting on that is because, because if I give too much wilga room, then there's, it's just, it goes into that direction. So I, I feel like I got to be so focused on get this stuff done first, then add to it. But I feel like there's room for, for that discussion because I'm seriously not opposed to it. In fact, it's great for testing. It's priming, you know, priming the pump, if you will. You know, there's like, like, in, like when you're sailing, there's low times. Sometimes you're coming to the harbor, you got to get out to get where the wind is, whatever it is, you know, it's, exactly. it's a useful tool, you know, and that's the way I would look at it. That's exactly it. Like we're just trying to find the best wind and uh, we want to get there quickly. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, hoist and, then sometimes, and, and, and sail yeah. into the sunset. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes it's like you got the wind and you have the wind and you want to like get going because you, you want to take advantage of the moment. So, you know, it's like it really, there is no, um, um, you know, it's I think more efficient on your motor. It's more efficient on your motor. Yeah. If you, you have know. the sail and the motor at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, I view that a little bit like say like the, if you look at the, uh, uh, the long and the short of it, the research, um, that I published and that I shared with, a within my book and, you know, there's the research around branding versus um, sales activation. That's kind of how I view um, mm -hmm. sales activation tends to be a little bit with uh, a different energy. And sometimes you could just attach paid to it. And that's kind of how I view that is they need to work harmoniously. You, there's no there, no good brands are doing strictly all brand only. I mean, only the ones that have been around for like maybe a thousand years, like Tide or something, you know. Uh, but even then, they're still doing sales activation and coupons and things of that nature. So. But yeah, I know it's like I'm glad we brought that up because a lot of people do think I'm I'm so harsh on the on the advertising, but that's that is my my stance is every sailboat's got a motor, you know. Um, yeah, it's both. But I think what you don't want to have is just a motorboat. I think that's dangerous. Correct. 
it is very dangerous, you know. And, you know, the story you just, you know, gave is like the second principle, give is the new get. It's like, you know, it's not new, but it's like the idea of, you know, that's just your nature, right? It's like building relationships and bridges. And sometimes you just like we overlook these, we see these these moments and that person remembered how you made them feel in the moment that they needed to feel it the most. And your toothbrush represents an entire it's a hope. It's a it's it's like it's a story. Like that's what's beautiful about your story is that you've you've created something out of nothing. You're making and you're a creator of impact. You're making something of impact in the world, which is all the things that you could have done, you could have probably found a much shorter path by making a toothbrush, a better toothbrush, but you wanted to make it something of impact. And, you know, and I guess the question I ask you is because this is what people say to themselves, is it worth it? I mean, I, I, yes, yes, I would say. Um, yeah. I think the... But on what level is it worth it though? That's the, that is the thing, right? Like that's what people, it's what I think people want is that, but they don't want to do, they don't, they're like, we have, but it's like, it's like, this is going to be faster. And I, I feel you when I'm, when I'm hearing about your impact that it's like, no, it's deeper than this. You know what? I think the other thing that maybe I took away from, from my time at Tony Robbins, but also just, you know, in the light of my last business where I worked so hard and gave everything really for an outcome, not for the journey, but it was very much like, what's the outcome going to be? It's like, actually, the quality of your life is really the quality of your emotions, to borrow a phrase from a well-known man that we've mentioned a few times. But it really is like how, like how you spend each minute, hour, day, week, month, that is the quality of your life because the only thing we all have is time and it's how you spend that time that is going to determine your experience of life. It's not like when you make $10 million, then you're going to have a good life. It's like the years preceding you getting that big exit. And I met plenty of people. I mean, it's a well-known cliche, like the most miserable people are the ones who just sold their companies and made lots of money and find out, oh, this wasn't the whole point all along and I've just wasted 20 years. Um, there's several plats I know who made tens of millions of dollars and then lost it all in cryptocurrency and, you know, kind of re-examined like, hmm, well, what's important to me? And I think for me, like to be able to do something that I care about, that enables me to give to people, that enables me to employ people, that has a more positive impact on the world, that I can be proud to talk to my children about, that, you know, gives me a, a variety of of purpose. Like it, it does act as a driver in those in those harder moments and it kind of makes me realize like yeah this is how i want to spend my time and the more that i can spend my time doing things i love and giving me positive emotions the better yeah i mean you know success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure right right to quote our tony robbins uh buddy and you know i think that's that's the i think what more people are searching for fulfillment than ever before and they're just not sure how to get there and I think with your story, you're giving it's a it's an it's an incredible story of hope. It's a, 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 a like it's just it's it's like it's going to continue to rise. And I, I think you're going to inspire so many impact creators. Um, you know, who are a lot of people listen to my or my audience that are they're 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 dreaming of making something of impact, or maybe they are, but they're what they the impact that they're making isn't isn't doing enough for them. It's not big enough for them. And I think that your your story is like such a big story and it's just begun. I, I think we'll look back at this podcast and go, man, I, I, I was lucky to get your attention in time. Uh, you know, this is one of those podcasts and, and uh, you know, in the future I'll be, I'll be hoping I can get your number because <laughs> you're going to explode. I see it. Yeah. yeah I did. Thank you very much. It's, it's funny though. Like, you know, yes, like since we started shipping, we're now at almost double digit million dollar revenue, which, which is fantastic. But I can tell you, honestly, like that's nice. And like, you know, it makes me feel quite good, but what makes me feel great genuinely great is like when consumers write back telling us like you know how they're they're brushing teeth more often or they really love it or or we've done something kind and they just really value it um that that actually makes me feel so much better and it makes me realize like you don't need to have uh you know a million dollar producing company in order to do that you can just be kind to people be generous give your time like it, it really you know that that fulfillment side for me i think I'm, I'm really doubling down on, on the other things that give me fulfillment outside of uh, just, you know, economic success, if that makes sense, you know, and I think that's achievable, like now, no matter what you do. And one of my last questions is, what's a groundswell to you when you hear groundswell and you've read my book? What does that mean to you? 
if I hear the word groundswell, I just think Scott Martin. So that's that's the first thing that I think. Um, but you know, a groundswell for me, it's something. It's it for me. It conveys depth. It conveys. It's not the superficial. It's like the deep down. It's like the. It's not the. It's not the superficial. It's like. It's it's like almost like the truth. It's it's like that that deep truth coming through. It's natural. It's unstoppable. It's it's long lasting and it's authentic. And those are the words for me that, that I associate with Grandswell. Yeah, thank you. And I think that this is what exactly what you're creating for yourself. Um, couldn't be any happier to have you on the podcast. I, I just am so happy that we got to pull this together. My, um, uh, where can people find you and, and buy your toothbrush and support your ground spell? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So people can buy it from our website, www.trysurrey.com. We ship globally. Um, we ship very quickly within North America. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram at discover Surrey. Um, or if you want, you know, I'm intrigued, like email me, uh, mark at trysurrey.com and i will give you a special discount code which i'll only reveal when you email me so let's see how many people do that beautiful right on well thank you so much for being on the show we're so stoked to have you thanks so much for having me scott it's been a real honor genuinely likewise all right everyone well this is another episode of the groundswell origins podcast as usual just go to groundswell.fm and drop me a voicemail just click on the mic and Leave me a little message or email me, scott at groundswellorigins.com. Jump in the community, groundswellinnercircle.com, and join the conversation. Until next time, mahalo. Mahalo.